thing that's better and stronger. And I think that all in working together and listening and communicating with one another so that we know what this hand and this hand are doing and working together to do that. It's really important to communicate and if you've got questions or anything like that to let us know, approach us. Here are those of you that are um, you know, live well where you can be. Communications person for the DBA and Amber, she's the president of the DBA and Andrews, our executive director for the chamber. So talk to us. It's really important so we know what's going on at any given time. If we can't do anything or nothing can be done if we don't know what concerns you have and where you want to head with any of this. So that's what we're here for tonight. And again, we have a community meeting tomorrow night. So we're just going to be meeting to meetings just to make sure all the message gets across to what we need to see done in our community. So again, thank you. I'm going to introduce... Yes, please come. This is Angela. I'm you want to try my last name? No, I don't. <laughs> Brenda Bell. <laughs> no, Brenda Bell. <laughs> yes, and Angela and Todd. And I don't know your last name. They've been here for the past, in our area for the past couple days, going around and talking to businesses. They're, they have great experience in recovery and rebuilding from flooding and different just catastrophes. Uh, High River, perfect example. On a little different scale, perhaps, than we have. But it doesn't matter what scale it is, it's a catastrophe and a disaster to us. It's all relevant to anything we're looking for. So I'm going to ask, first of all, tonight, just uh, for a quick update from um, Community Futures. We have Jennifer Whitmore and Wendy, or Susan Green, excuse me, I know that. They're going to give us just a quick update on what Community Futures has been up to, and we will go forward from that. And then I will give, shortly, we'll get some updates, and then I'll have Angela and Todd take the floor and let us know what's, what's wrong. So, Jennifer, Susan. Yes, okay. So, hi everybody. Thanks for having us here tonight. Uh, we have been working um, as of May 15th very actively in some core specific areas, including um, first approach to the province for funding support for the development of a disaster recovery and economic renewal. Uh, process and we have been successful in our conversations with the province. We will be bringing a group of people um, into the downtown core starting on June 25th, 26th and then back again in September. Um, I think Angela has some experience working with um, this type of a process and she can certainly give you her opinion on that. Um, we are also actively working, and Susan you can stand up and talk whenever you want, <laughs> on getting money out the it door. Isn't standing. Okay, sure. Yeah. <clears throat> Hey, I only found out when I got here that I was actually speaking to people. And as I mentioned before, speaking to a whole crowd of people is not my thing. Speaking to you individually as businesses one-on-one, -on -one, I'm much better at that. In the last two and a half weeks, I have written 11 new loans and rewritten nine existing loans for businesses. We are doing these loans based on um, no payments till November 1st, no interest, no fees. That is to give everybody a chance to get their DFA money or their insurance money or whatever is going to kick in. If at November 1st you can't pay your loans back, then we will negotiate with you at the current rates at that time and make it so the payment will cripple you. We're desperately trying to help the businesses get over this little hump and go forward. So just come see me. We will look at anything. I can't say that there is no set low limit or high limit. Everybody's done on an individual basis. And I have already met with some of you, I know. So yes, it's been an interesting two and a half weeks. We're also working on the work BC EI end of things, wage incentives for employers. We have a team of six individuals who are out working out of our Grand Forks office on helping to fast track EI applications, trying to get things in line, trying to have discussions with businesses about, we've, we've heard a lot of discussion about the complications around keeping employees right now um, who may or may not be finding other opportunities as a result of what we're dealing with. Uh, we're trying to get creative with that. 
Um, we will continue to keep everyone apprised of the movement on the disaster recovery team and the work that they'll be doing. Um, and certainly, I think most of you know where we are right by A&W. Please come and see us if you have questions. And we're interested to hear um, from the Chamber and the DBA and Angela and Todd um, a, a whole lot more. So, thank you. Jen, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, regarding the six people that you have fast-tracking, are those existing community features and yes. or anything? Yes. We have had Service Canada in the office a couple of times, maybe four times over the last month. We're taking uh, them back Aria? Okay. Yeah. So, so we had quite a few. We had Dave Dale who was in, in our office and we just made our space available as people needed it. Um, and we're happy to help out if you have any questions about that as well. We're trying to keep a, a, a database maintained that um, will we'll help you understand where people are currently located or where there's available space. Posted on the website, right? Okay. Any questions? Other than Gina's? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Kendra, may you have a Moment. Kendra is our executive director. Those of you who haven't met Kendra. Hi, Hi Kendra. Um, so thank you everybody for coming. We do lots of biz after biz events and, and it's so great that a lot of you guys come out that don't always come out to all these different events. Um, I just wanted to, to clarify a couple of things because I have met with most business owners that are face to face but there's definitely some I still haven't connected with and I just wanted to clarify a couple of pieces. Um, one, our, our role with the Chamber is to work in collaboration with the DBA, with Community Futures, with the City of Grand Forks, with Regional District, with Red Cross, uh, with the services that are already available. So we're not trying to duplicate effort, efforts or uh, step on toes, just trying to work in collaboration with. Um, and the Chamber has just been working on really trying to gain information from the business members so that we can gain insight on what the needs and asks and requests are to forward those on. So if it's, it's kind of making connections with community futures and what they're doing, or making connections with the city because we, we need streets clean. Those pieces is just trying to, to make sure that those resources are available and trying to be that voice a little bit. Um, the other piece that I want to clarify too is that um, <clears throat> Angela and Todd who came here from, from High River, that request came from business members. I spoke to a lot of people who said, you know, if the High River went through this, can we gain some information? Can we gain some insight? I agreed with that. I had, I've had i been through fire um, emergency before, living in the Okanagan and in Alberta. I had not been through a flood myself, a um, disaster plan. And so I was interested in trying to gain some information from them. Um, and I know that Community Futures was working on some of the other pieces with insurance and bringing the reps in and Dale Wielden and those. And so I just wanted to, to try and gain some knowledge from them. And their goal was to sort of come out, meet, assess, see where it's out from an outsider perspective and then provide some knowledge and insight for us moving forward so we can have a very strategic plan uh, working with stakeholders in collaboration to move forward. So having said that, I'd really like to introduce Angela Grenoval and Todd Williams, who are here. Um, at the end of this, they may make a reference to the survey, which I'm just finished getting the rest of that piece together. So I, uh, and I'll email out to the vast majority, as well as to all the stakeholders to get out, and I'll make those available as well. So you can come kind of see me, I'll be on the streets with them. Um, our office won't be up and running until July 1st, but once that's where you can find me after that. So please, Angela. Thank you. Okay, so um, <laughs> from High River, but don't shoot me because I'm originally from Cranmer, BC. So I'm really a BC girl, and uh, I go to Kimberly and Cranmer quite often. And um, I was really excited to, I love to pay it forward. I've been in, in uh, High River since the day of the flood in the EOC, and I think everybody is gone but me <laughs> left in renewal. Um, so what, what a lot of experts will come into your community and they'll recover, and you, you just really have to have that local pulse. Now there's one thing I can say to you is community recovers community. Nobody will care about your recovery as much as you do. In here, you're going to have experts that are going to come in and they're going to give you advice and listen to them. Don't be afraid of the outsiders. Don't close them out. But they just because don't reinvent the wheel. But um, I've also worked with uh, Doug Griffiths, who is a speaker. Uh, 13 ways to kill your community. Uh, we work across North America, um, uh, sharing how to not kill your community. And uh, some of the chapters he talks about is don't cooperate and um, reject everything, live in the past, ignore outsiders. And I, and I want to emphasize that he was the municipal affairs for uh, 2013 floods, 11 communities. 
He was the minister that gave out the money, and I think if there's rumors of $5 billion is what um, the money that went out to recover that. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what size of disaster it is. The model and the process is still the same. We did quite a bit of things in High River that we had to get done very fast. And the reason we brought Todd Williams with us is because he project managed all the temporary stuff that went up. The housing, the temporary business park, the library, the donation centers, the renewal office, the recovery offices, all of those were deployed within the first 100 days. The decisions were made probably in the first three weeks. The reason, when you hear my stories that I'm going to share, and the reasons that we were so successful is resources. We had the government stand up and say, whatever you need, go and do it. So we didn't have to worry about the grants and the money and all that kind of stuff that we just knew. So um, if that's not in place for you, um, don't compare yourself to us because that was one of the reasons why we were able to. And I think it's coming and, I think, and there's a lot of stuff in motion. But I'm not here to talk about that high level strategic stuff. I'm here to talk to you as business owners. I'm a business owner that's been through two man-made disasters, and those are ones that are, um, I have mad cow disease happen on the ranch, and another one is, is I own businesses in Kimberly, Cranbrook, and Fernie, BC, and when the mine shut down and the disposable income goes, they affect your business. So I know what it takes to recover, and I'm here to inspire you and then tell you that you can build back better because I've been doing it for five years. I'm working with Puerto Rico right now, it's the exact same model. It's the exact same thing that we're doing down here at Grand Forks and that we did in High River. I was part of Fort McMurray. What you see here are all the recovery plans. To know that you have Dale Wilden and BCEDA coming, you are in good hands. He was part of this uh, report that was done for High River. And this report, when it was complete, and that technical team that she's talking about that's coming, they will, give a, they will give such a high level assessment. You can see how thick this is. From this plan is where I'm the business renewal officer in the recovery office. And from this plan, I then ask the government for money to build the wayfinding, to build the market plan, to build the economic development strategy. But whatever it is, Nobody knows for Grand Forks until that assessment's done because every community and disaster is unique of their, how they're going to recover. The model to do it, the phase one, phase two, phase three, uh, Dale and I, he asked me to come speak at the uh, BC Economic Developers Conference. Um, and he did his slide be presentation before mine. They were identical. And we laughed because I said that, that we're all saying the same message, that process, but now it's time to customize it. For, uh, for Grand Forks, I'm going to say in a river because I get this confused. So how did we do it is the question that you're probably asking yourself. And this one is, is Fort McMurray's, and you can see the size of that one. They had two disasters. They had um, their main number one industry go down, oil. And so already people are leaving, already stuff is happening, and jobs and no disposable income, and then they have that uh, fire in there. Uh, this is the, the business plan. This is probably something that you'll see that Dale will be providing and the team will be providing, and this will be the phases. We are in High River. We are in phase three. It's just started on year five. So I'm going to be sharing with you what those phases are, but my story may not be your story. Until that technical team comes in and assesses everything and talks to all you stakeholders, which I'm so proud of you that you're all here. Just about every community I've gone into, the stakeholders and the business communities relationship are stronger than ever after a disaster. Arlene Dickinson says, don't ever, don't ever um, not leverage a crisis. There's opportunity in every crisis. That's what's going to happen here. Your community, your stakeholders, your business community is going to be stronger than ever. And that is something to really look forward to, and that's what my job tonight is to give you a little bit of hope about that. So how to build back better. Some questions that are going in your head right now probably are, will the businesses reopen and residents rebuild? Will the downtown survive? Vacancy, can it become stronger? Will commercial and residential development resume? Will Grand Forks be able to rebrand itself as a viable and safe community to invest in long term? Will people have disposable income to support our local stores? And what is a false economy? 
So the first one, will businesses reopen and will residents rebuild? So yes, they will. 13,000 people were evacuated from High River. 1,300 businesses um, were evacuated. We retained 90% of those businesses. The 10% of the businesses that we did not retain were ones that were secessioning out. This was an opportunity for them to get out because they wanted to retire or they wanted to change or they were doing it as a supplementary job. Some businesses had to move out of our town to go do another location like a dentist office and a vet and no, they didn't come back. But that's gonna happen. FEMA, Restore Your Economy, which, which is where I get my training from with this industry, is says that 30 to 40 percent of your business community will not come back after a major disaster. Nope, uh, we didn't do it. Fort McMurray's doing okay. So it's because we're getting trained and we're bringing these resources in and we're able to, but it's the business owners, it's you. It's you, you're gonna get all of your business stakeholders that are gonna be bringing you lots of supports and services and it is so important that they hear from you. They're here to serve you. They're doing all of this to keep you open. So you need to have a strong voice and say what that is. I shared today a few items that we learned on the ground just from entrepreneurs. What do you need right now? What's in the way? What's stopping you? Dale and his team are going to be coming in and they're going to be asking a little deeper questions, a little more, with more of a strategy behind it, but we just wanted to get a feel and a pulse. And I'll tell you one thing, nobody wants to leave this community. All of you, even some of you sit by, like I swear I'm going to write a story about the chairs in front of your businesses. Watching a business owner sit in their chair and looking back at their business, at first my stomach got a little nervous when I was seeing this and then I thought, no, they're looking and they're dreaming, they're going like, what can I build now? What can I be now? What can I do differently in there? I'm going to read, what are my new floor colors or wall colors? What's my floor going to look like? And yeah, there's probably some moments that they're a little tired and stuff. But this is where you as business owners need to lean on each other. You need to help each other and you need to be together with each other. Don't go on social media when you're upset. You know that 24 hour rule to not yell at your team? I know that. It's so true. So that rule when you don't yell at your coach or your parent or your kids um, and as such, um, don't do that on your social media because the world's watching you right now. And so if you start to, to if you don't like living here, do you think anybody else is going to want it? If you don't like the customer service in the stores, it's not just going to hurt that store, it's going to hurt the whole street. So try to remember this when you go to rant and rave. Just phone up a business owner, just phone up somebody, take your dog for a walk and talk and call me. I'll give you my business cards, call me, I've heard it all, I've been called everything. We didn't have a warm welcome coming into town. And that's okay, it happens every time we go because we're outsiders and maybe we have an agenda. And maybe Angie wants a job. That's, that's been the common one I've been hearing. No, I don't want a job. I have lots of jobs, unfortunately. I've got lots of disasters I'm looking after. I wanted to help. When I got a call to come and ask to help with the people here, I, that's what we do when we're in this field. And, um, and then when I knew that there was an awesome team coming, I was even more excited. So my goal was to let you know that even more help is coming and exciting. So, will the residents rebuild? Yeah, they don't want to go anywhere else. But we got to get the resources on the ground. And who's going to tell what the resources are? You guys. Encourage those residents to keep talking and say what they need and help them out. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Pulling the heartstrings to the sponsors, to the corporate guys, you only have a certain amount of time to be doing this. We found that the business community doesn't get a lot of volunteer help. And it's, I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's because you're private sector or what happens, but the volunteers will come into the community and they'll go to the homes. But you know where my heart is? You as a business owner during the day are doing your business and then you're going home to fix in your home. Who needs really more help? So don't be afraid to put that ask out there. If you've got a major highway going down the, that lots of traffic flow you could be leveraging. Will the downtown survive vacancy and can it become stronger? Oh yeah, this is your opportunity. What I was jealous about when I came into town was the layout of your downtown. High River has spent a lot of money on their downtown. Start to Google High River on YouTube. And uh, what, what I stood here and I looked out down here and I said, Todd, are you sure there was a disaster? <laughs> it is beautiful. We, 
hired O2 Planning Urban Systems, and we had them design us a new downtown because it was wiped up. Infrastructure underneath the streets and everything. We built back our downtown looked like just like this. I'm not kidding. When you see the pictures and the wide sidewalks and the patio, we, we took 48 parking stalls out of the town, out of the streets, because we said we're building for people first, pedestrian friendly first, because that's what the future is gonna build. Don't build these downtowns for short term. Build them for 10, 20, 30 years, which is going to be people riding their bikes, driverless cars, and they want place making. Then I seen parallel parking on one side, angle parking on the other, beautiful lights. You guys look open at nighttime. We look like a ghost town. There's no enticement to go down there and shop. We're, we're still getting our lights happening. And the greenery and the trees, you've got full grown, we have got little, little sticks that we're hoping are gonna get big. But you guys have the foundation, it's here. And I think there's some more phases of where this is gonna go. So will this attract? Absolutely it will. This is, Downtowns are the heart of the communities. You're gonna get cluster marketing and you're gonna get, um, we, we have secured 285,000 commercial square feet since the flood. So where are they all? They're all in the development because they all want traffic flow. But those are people that go in and they buy and they go out. The downtown is where the heart is and where the locals enjoy the culture and the spirit. And look inside here with the local art and the locals right. I can't even believe how busy your streets are, are right now. So we want to keep telling that story. Imagine if I was your business development and this is that energy and this is how we talked and we're selling and doing it. This is your job. Every one of you need to be talking like this every time you talk about Grand Forks. And when you're crabby, you call me. <laughs> Don't go on. But it will come back because we have had it come back in High River. We built back stronger. We brought fiber optics in. I was talking about that. That is the number one utility that your investment down the road is looking for. Graphic design, everything. We were going to lose our banks if we didn't get fiber optics in. Uh, that is a utility. So just uh, I, I talked to the CAOs and stuff today about that, and I learned that there's some initiatives going on already with that. So uh, you're, again, you're ahead of the game. Will commercial and residential development resume? So development is probably gonna be on hold for a little while, but that's okay, because we need to restore our, our local, um, the ones that are need to be fixed. What we can do is put on a local expo right now, and we can start to use our local businesses and our local trades. We did this in High River, we did this in Fort McMurray, and it was a huge success. So. Let's, let's try to keep um, the big guys out. I call them storm chasers. We do need them. We need them at a time because there's not capacity in your local community. But we could get you together. We could get the plumbers together, the utility, the drywall guys. They could work together and get some of these big contracts. And as a renewal office start, I learned today a lot of the stuff that's going to be coming and going down. And you're going to start to see things really ramp up for recovery here. Make sure through your business organizations that, that local procurement is given to you guys. Be at the table, be watching it, and see if you can get some of these contracts. Because that's where the fluctuation of money that's coming into the community right now that will be happening with recovery, if it's spent times six in the community. If you hire someone local, that dollar goes around six times. So will Grand Forks be able to rebrand, rebrand, rebrand itself as a viable and safe place? That's where you want to start telling the story about when the flood mitigation happens. So I, I had some people halt and say, well, we gotta wait and see if we're gonna come back. Once the decisions are made on flood mitigation, then everybody feels safe again. But you gotta market it and you gotta start telling the story. I do feel that some people are on the fence right now of not knowing which way it's gonna go because we're only on day 32. And those are some big, big decisions. I do not believe, and this is just me, that they're going to take your downtown out. It's too beautiful, and there's lots of stuff going on down here. And But um, what, what are we doing for flood mitigation down the road? That's something that has to be looked at right now, and I think it is, and it's very aggressively. So when you guys are bombarding your council and your CEO, even, even uh, Jennifer talked about um, you have to know from May 15th, this is the things that we've been doing. Well, we don't understand. We don't understand that why as business owners, but it is so important that she gets that stuff in place for you, for the long-term recovery and to get the resources in here. It's the same as the council. They're making decisions on stuff that are so big, but they're not affecting you right now on the bottom line as a business owner. I know every day you're getting up and you're looking at your bank account 
and you're talking to your employees and you're scared. It's okay, you can be, but please believe me that you can come back and you can be stronger from it. I, that's why we wanted to come, because we want to inspire that. The shock local events, start getting creative. Don't wait for other people to do it. Don't wait for your organizations. You guys can start to come up with ideas. Wait, start to form some networking or ask your business stakeholders, can we just have like an informal networking like tonight where we come out and we come up with three ideas to keep traffic flow going down here? Or can we go lend a hand as a business owner that's trying to clean out their business right now? And, and then we want to tell that story all on social media. Tonight, we're gonna, you're going to see me marketing and why Les is recording is we are telling the world that Grand Forks cares. They are not going anywhere. They are rebuilding their community and it's, it's three quarters done. We're just going to get some businesses up and going and you're ready to roll. We're going to get some signage on that highway as soon as we can and we're going to pull the heartstrings and get every one of them to come in. But we can do some short-term reactive stuff like that. But when Dale comes in and he talks about an economic development team and he brings those guys in, he's going to give you a strategy. He's going to talk to you about the branding and the whole story. And then maybe you can hire someone local mar market-wise to make those signs and get it. And you continue that story. We are rooted in people in High River because our community built back our community and we thank them for it. And all of our imaging and everything that we tell, invest here, live here, play here, rooted in people. We didn't come up with that, but we came up with the economic development strategy to tell us to say what to say and to put in, in there and tell the story. So I'm not going to get into details on that. But. Well, people have disposable income to support our local stores. So I'm going to talk to you guys about false economy, what that is here. This is from FEMA. And I don't think you can see it. Does everyone know what FEMA is? Yeah. Does someone want to explain it? Federal Emergency Management Association? So this is, uh, this is an organization of the U.S. Uh, uh, Federal Emergency Management Association. So they have lots and lots and lots of studies. So in these experts that Dale brought these guys to High River, he had two from um, FEMA and Restore Your Economy uh, come down to talk to us. This is where I learned this stuff from them. So Dale will be talking to this again. Is you have the, you have the um, impact of the disaster and you're in shock. That's what happens. And these are your emotions that are happening. But you have to remember that you're the res residents. And the sh when we talk about these emotions, these are the emotions that the people that shop in your stores are going through. So they're in shock. So they're not spending any money. Their their um, fight or flight response. They're wanting to go and help and volunteer and to do things, and move around, and they're not thinking about purchasing things at that time. So the impact happens, Every the emergency state, the businesses come back in and they start to build their businesses and they start to clean up the floor and they're open. Every time a business opens, I want to see all of this. All of you there, give them a round of applause, celebrate them, blast them on social media, cut the ribbon, stakeholders are there, have a party and get less the video and tell the world. Let everybody know it's coming back and it's coming back. So that is the heroic. So that's going to happen for a while, and then you're all going to be open. And you're all, everyone's shopping, and it's a busy season, and everything's going on. And then all of a sudden, your insurance has come in, the DFA's money has come in, and you've got money to go buy the clothes that you lost, and the furniture that you've lost, and everything. And then all of a sudden, that money's gone, you've bought everything. So I want to prepare you as business owners that that's going to happen, and so is that shopping pattern. Also, most of you are in it, you know your sales cycles that happens in your businesses. Take that sales cycle of your cash flow, lay it out, when is my busy season, when is my slow season, and now think about what I just said and put that parallel to it. Prepare yourself. Community Futures will probably be bringing in some business coaches. This is what they'll talk to you about. You can take it to them and you can say, okay, what do, where's my slow season going to be? Where do I got to watch? Where do I want to lay some staff off? Or where do I want to ramp it up with advertising? So there's going, to be the, there's going to be that false economy that's going to come in a little bit because it's going to peak with the, with the reconstruction and the recovery and then it's going to drop a little. It's not bad. That's not a bad thing. But I want to prepare you because I've seen some really bad business decisions made in that where you go borrow a bunch of money and you go diversify and you bring in some new products and you bring in some new sale, um, new items or new services 
and it's rampant and it's rolling and six months later, okay, nothing happens. We had a lot of construction guys in High River and so not a lot of restaurants were open. So this one guy borrowed $90,000 and he went and bought a mobile um, truck and he served cold beer and pop and lunches and he drove around to all the construction guys in the community and he made a lot of money for about three months. And then, it, and then winter came, and so nobody's really wanting to eat outside while they keep going. And he is because his little bar and his little pub was hurting a bit. And then when the next season came, um, the, the construction was over. Everything was rebuilt. So all, all the hotels were now, all that people were gone. You're back to regular operations. He's got a big debt. $90,000 or something it was he spent on this. I think he sold the truck. But I, he, I, he ha, I have his permission to talk about that because he wants to pay it forward where you react and you see a gap, but you gotta think it out. Would he have been better to not make that, you know, still serve them, but maybe make it in your kitchen and go do delivery? Something like that, right? Oh, now I gotta get out of this, sorry. A little pause, think of your questions. So I talked about things that you can do now, events. So we hired through the renewal officer a event coordinator and uh, that person was incredible on how they got sponsorship. Uh, there was a first response or restoration truck out here. I, I don't know the name of it, it's probably best if you're recording that, you don't. Anyways, she was the type of person that she'd go talk to them and she'd say, you've got some pretty big contracts going on downtown, right? Yeah. Would you put a, um, a Friday Night Biz Network thing on, or would you put a free barbecue on downtown? And then we'd go call some bands and we'd say, come on down and have a busker, everybody come on down and do donations, we'd have a party. And the, um, that's what draws people down. When you have entertainment, when you have free food, that's what's going to cause the residents <coughs> down. You guys leverage that traffic flow. Open those doors, let them use your washrooms, give them discounts, and thank them. Look them in the eyes and say, is there any products in my store or my services that I'm missing? Is there anything we can do? Get their databases, under, like get to know them, keep track of their stuff, and then keep sending them stuff. Find out when their birthdays are. So year-end school is coming right now. Start putting some packages together. Let's celebrate our teachers. Let's have a party. Well, let's call res first response guy and ask him to sponsor the whole thing. This is what she did. This is what her job was, is to keep that traffic flow and keep those wallets opening downtown. We didn't have a stakeholder that would do that. We were like, will you do it? Will you do it? Will you do it? Well, who's going to fund this and what's going to happen? So we had one business owner got a little fed up about it and he wrote a check for $10,000 and he said pay me back when you can. And that's all it took was a little bit of seed money. Once we got rolling, then we realized that that worked and that's why that event coordinator started to follow that, that we realized people would sponsor and do it. So if you can't find anybody right now and you don't have an event coordinator, get creative yourself and think about how you can do it. Think about who your most, your biggest employer is in town or someone that's really benefiting right now and just ask them if they can help with some money for it or resources. So maybe one of the things right now is do some of these businesses, while these landlords are working their butts off trying to re get their place open, do we have some business owners that need somewhere to go? That's the question and that's what I've been trying to find out here. And I've shared that with the stakeholders and I don't want to really comment on what I found out about because I want to wait till Dale gets here to ask more of a deeper dive. I am going to be sharing with him, with the stakeholders, what that is, um, of who it is and stuff, but there's, I can't make a comment right now because I haven't talked, and it would be false information. I haven't talked to you all. I see a lot of vacancy and I see a lot of closed doors right now, but if you go and build a temporary business park like we did and you bring some businesses in it, are we competition to the landlords that have space that are ready to go? So now, that, you know, we, we got to figure all this out. It's a little bit more deeper of a dive that has to happen. But what I'm worried about is while it takes a long time for that business to open, that business owner's bank account is draining. And so when the landlord gets it ready to open, they, they're, they're not, oh, they can't do it anymore. So we want to keep that alive, too. They're, whether they're working out of their home or whether you have space in your business right now and you could move some product over and say, is there anybody that doesn't have available space that would love? We want to keep them downtown. We don't want them to go anywhere else. We want to keep all the shopping here. So maybe you can offer some space. We had a jewelry store move into a wedding shop. 
We had got different shoes and different things like that move into clothing stores. Your professional service started to sell. There's creative things that you can do like that. Get going. So what are the workforce needs and who can lead this and help outsource? I, I think that, um, I'm not even going to touch on that. I know it's a question that was asked, but I think, Jennifer, you're, you've got a team with work. BC, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I think just talk to those guys and what your concerns are. Would you agree? Is that yes. you'd like them to go? Yeah. yeah. Um, you got a resource here, so utilize it. But if you're having troubles, one of the things that we did was um, shared jobs, uh, shared employees. My favorite story about Fort McMurray. Um, they do pitch nights, and the Community Futures uh, a Business Association and the Economic Development and the Chamber. They called them, I forget what they were called. Anyways, these are the most powerful networking nights I've ever seen. And I, I used to say Fort McMurray is like entrepreneurship on steroids. This, it's, it was neat to see this. Because they're so isolated. They have no help. They don't have traffic flow going by like that. They've got to really own in what, what's in that community. So I go to this event, and usually the people and the guests get up at the front and they talk. They did it the other way around. So we, we were um, in the crowd, and they would say to us, okay, Angela's here to talk about um, blah, 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 and we got the banks that are here to talk about this, and the mic is sitting up at the front, and I'm like, what is going on? And they got appetizers and a cash bar. You gotta have alcohol, you gotta, everyone's gotta loosen up. So you can buy the guy a drink. And the business owners got up, and they talked on the microphone, and they said, hi, it's Angie, and I am having troubles right now because I own a flooring store. And I really want to get all the contracts for all the flooring that's going to be happening, like all the sales of the rebuild that's going to be happening. My best sales guy moved. His wife said no more and they left. So I've got such an opportunity here, but I don't have anybody trained that wants to do it. This business owner gets, puts his hands up and he says, I'll help you. And he says, for $10,000, I'll lend you my best salesman from my car dealership. Because no one's buying cars right now. You know, this is in the early stage. And, he's, and she said, okay, deal. And they went off, and they went and talked. This happened all night. These business owners got up, and they would just mingle, and they'd have grace, and they'd talk, and then they'd go grab the microphone, and they'd be like, I was thinking, I'm thinking about putting something on. I was wondering if someone wants to help me, or this is where I'm needing help, or what do you guys think of this idea? The business owners got to network and make decisions instead of doing what I'm doing right now, is talking to you, letting, letting you guys talk. I followed up after with those, and I said, did you guys cut a deal? I, I just, this, that was amazing to me. He said, yeah. He goes, I got to pay him $10,000 um, but uh, the, for lending him. He stays as the employee at the car dealership. He's going to keep paying him, and the car dealership, or the employee, gets to make the commission on the sales. But as soon as the guy needs him back for his job, he has to go back. That was the, and they shared. They shared their resources. So that same story happened on small levels. It happened when um, somebody needed to close up their shop for a couple days or go somewhere, they would just job share and, and lend each other. So um, if we can get any grants, Jennifer I know is probably working so hard probably from May 15, free money. A lot of, as any, if we can get free money for you guys, I'm working for you on that also. If we can get any free money or any free resources for you, because the banks tell me that businesses have a six month window. So if you can if you can reach out somehow to help get those resources there, just be careful on how much debt you take on. Because it that is one of the things in year three with the business owners, when the economy is going back to regular, the ones with the heavy debt to recover, those are the ones that had a little bit of time. So when I heard that there were community features as interest free or um, what was it like if you need a break? No fees, no interest, no payments till the end of the Right, and I used to work for Committee Futures, and they, um, they'll continue that. If you're really, no, I shouldn't put words in your mouth, but they're flexible. They'll work with you it, it, based on your cash flow. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, so those, that, those opportunities are there. I know most banks do that, but ask for that up front. BC Tourism, we had Alberta Tourism really step up and help us. Um, something that you can do right now is get some signage on that highway. Uh, you, you're going into tourism season, let's draw them downtown. It doesn't have to be fancy right now. Let's just pull the heartstrings and let's start saying things or let's give them events to come down here for it. But I'd be leveraging that highway some, some way. A 
Well, when I came into town, that's what I was looking for. What's, what's drawing me downtown? What's drawing me downtown? How do I know where downtown is? I want to see this neat stuff, right? So try to have those eyes when you look in there. Um, constant streamline of communication. So help each other out as business owners. If you hear something, move it along and then keep that going. I know that when the recovery office operations gets up and going, you'll probably see a better deal with that. We have a counselor here nodding, so we're only on day 32, so we do the best we can. I think the last thing I'm going to look at it talk about is the commercial gap analysis. This is an opportunity for you to talk to your customers when they're in your store and you're trying to make conversation with them. Ask them what they're missing. Ask them where they're shop what they're shopping online for. Ask them why they're going to Kelowna, uh, and and just see if you can find that and start to share it with each other. We can get into a, in economic development. You can do a fifty thousand dollar formal commercial gap analysis on your community. You do an industry sector. We find out who, what businesses are in your community, and then we do a survey to quality of life to your residents, and we say, what do you need for products and services? And then we compile that and we market it out to site selectors, to investors, and say, here's the gaps in the community. Don't you don't want to do that? You want to do that for you guys. You guys figure that out so you can bring those products and services in your store. I'm done now. I love question. Did you want to share anything? Did you want to talk about collaboration? I think you have to be getting all this knowledge now. I think we just opened up all yeah. the doors. Yeah. I've got so many stories to share. Collaboration and working together. Uh, you guys are going to love your business community, but I, I just I want to open it up now for you guys to ask questions because through the case studies in real life, that's I think how I can help. So, is there any questions? Yeah. Um, I have a question. Angela, I'm a government agent from Service BC across the street, which is the equipment, well, you know, Pembroke has yeah. Service BC. Um, we were, um, we bugged out in May, like everybody is probably aware, we are now at the Art Gallery. Um, you had talked about events to draw people back downtown. Um, we right now, on Tuesdays and Fridays, watch a pulse that happens at Gyro Park. We have, we have the, uh, the farmer's market that's happening. You, would, you can't park around the art gallery right now. And I thought of this before. I think that there's an opportunity to be able to bring that event downtown into the court Tuesdays and Fridays. Your, business, your, your community will start to see that when you're opening up, they're going to come down for the farmer's market, but then when they start to see what you guys are doing, like right now, it is so busy right there. Like I was looking out of the windows today. It doesn't look like anything that bad has happened to Grand Forks. It is hugely busy. We came down, I was working across the street today too, so you know, it, when you're here at this particular business, it, it's thriving. When you walk by um, the boardroom or by, um, sorry, time and plate, you know, thank God that you guys kept the pulse going, that you guys knew how to sandbag, that you guys saved it. It wasn't for you three restaurants in particular. There wouldn't be, you know, the vibrancy that you're seeing down here, but you can do, you can bring that farmer's market, I think, down here. I mean, it's not my decision, and I, I certainly am not a business owner, but there's people. There's people moving around, and you can bring them down. They want something to do. People want to go to things, so that's what downtowns are about, place making and culture. So yeah, I, it, now, the logistics of cutting a street up, we do it every Thursday. We called it the artisan's market, and then we, we just, it was called the artisan's market because we were trying to get the home-based businesses out of them and get them exposed. And um, and then people want something unique because you can go to Walmart, you can go to superstores and everything. But if you bring those unique items, it's fun to grab that coffee and go for lunch and just browse. Um, and it and then it morphed into farmers market and it's continually going. So these are these are things that yeah I agree. Is there any other question? Yeah. Well, look, hey, thank you for coming down here. I've been a heck of a cheerleader for the for business and all that kind of stuff. But before I've been here to talk a lot of people, and I think you touched on a little bit about the mitigation thing. And um, I, I don't know, um, I kind of think that people would be really reluctant to, to uh, if they've lost their businesses and, and their rental homes and all that kind of stuff. A lot of people have, and uh, they probably won't get a lot of money from insurance if they're rental homes and whatnot. Um, the mitigation, I think, is a huge thing. I, I don't see how people can have that confidence to, to, to reinvest a uh, whole bunch more money in this community if they can't see a path forward as to how the governments or whatever are going to keep this from happening again. I know in High River they had a pretty big plan to uh, to do a lot of infrastructure work and stuff to, uh, to show up the, um, 
the, the, the creeks and stuff that did that, we don't see that here. So um, I kind of think that's a real problem over there. It, for business investment, it is. You, and uh, the so it didn't happen overnight with High River. There was a lot of plans and a lot of discussions that went by it. When we were in a state of emergency, the elected officials were pushing and pushing and pushing, and the government to make decisions to make a money commitment. And as soon as they got it, the, the shovels were in the ground. We are the we are the number one protected flood community in Canada because of it. Yeah. Millions of dollars have been spent. We're just your government changed. We went from conservative to NDP. We have a halt there on the last part of the burn, but we had temporary burning. So there, even there are solutions that you could just put temporary burning in to the decisions are made. But I do know that it takes time for those discussions, and, and I do know those discussions are happening, but I, I, I can't share any more. I think that's really where the, your town officials can speak on it. So it's almost like putting the cart before yeah. the horse before the business owners decide they want to invest back in the rebuilding thing. They have to have the confidence that this yeah. isn't going to happen again next year, right? Well, you know, and the problem is probably saying the same thing, right? If we're going to give you a bunch of money to recover, is this just going to happen again next year? So I, they're all, I, I, everybody knows, it's the elephant in the room. It's the timing of when the answer is going to be made, and I'm just not the right person to answer that stuff. But I know it needs to happen, and I know where you're at with it, and as soon as it does, it'll, it'll make things easy. But, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm dodging the question because I don't know the answer. It is interesting, though, because the, we have a quirky bit of timing happen. I've lived here now for 14 years, and it's every three or four years. There's, oh, Timmy's is coming. Timmy's coming. Half the community wants it. Half the community doesn't. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't happen. Well, council meeting yesterday, there's a Timmy's coming. It's going to be right downtown. And they didn't make the decision after the flood, but still, they haven't backed away from it. That's a significant investment. And whether or not that's a good thing for the... Uh, other competitors downtown, that's a completely different story, but there's a Timmy's coming to town, which means there'll be a lot of people stopping on the highway instead of going, well, where's the Timmy's? Oh, I'll it's an hour down the road. That Tim Hortons has put a community bulletin board on it. Yeah. Everybody's going to stop off the highway to get their Timmy's, right? Yeah. Leverage that traffic. Pull them in and let them know everything that's going on. They're stopping anyways, and if they hear music, and if they hear something neat, or they see some advertising or something going on, leverage it, bring them in. And they'll be right across the street from that park that I'm has the that. yeah market in it. So. Um, I work for the city, um, so I quickly, in regards to the businesses, um, the only thing I can say right now is there was a tiger dam installed. You guys all seen the orange monster that protected the, the town, basically, or the downtown core before the potential second wave. The bolts are still in the ground, so they filled the holes currently simply with bolts that they want to smoothen them out so they're in the winter the snow plows don't hit them. But the engineering is done now. That tiger dam, if needed, can be redeployed in the event something like this is about to happen again next year. So there, there's precaution there. We're not just sealing the holes all back up, and it would take a while to set it all back up. This would be faster next year. So if I was a business development officer and somebody said to me, so I'm thinking about investing or going, I'd be telling that story right there. And I'd be saying, don't worry. They're protected for the second wave came in and blah, 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 blah. Because you want to take that fear up. They, are, they need time to make proper decisions, but in the meantime, they're protected. And the, I didn't know that. That's good to know. I know you used it, but I didn't know it's still in place. Yeah, so the, the holes are still in the ground. There will be, uh, and they can basically be opened up again and the Tiger Dam be installed in the same location. The engineering work has been done, and it would not protect every business, but I think it was about 90% of the businesses or so were protected. And the 10% that aren't? I think somebody wants to say something, but the 10% that aren't, put the elephant in the room, let them know who they are, and let's get them some help. Let's have a plan in place for them so that they're not and they're not stuck going, hey, we'll take all your water. Good thing you guys are safe. But you know, but you, you have to realize that. Did you want to say something? Hi. Uh, yeah, Jim, well, that wasn't the problem with the downtown flooding. I hope you realize that time you're yeah. now. The flooding came from the infrastructure. And for all of us business owners and, and all these insurance companies and stuff to be pounding money back into these businesses right now before anybody has looked at the damage to the infrastructure in this downtown area, I think it's crazy. 
because I can visually see sinkholes and the roads change. There's cracks everywhere. I mean, before you start pumping hundreds of thousands of dollars into, into this downtown area, we should really take a good, hard look at our infrastructure and see what's going on. Uh, ultrasound, all sorts of stuff. There's voids under the ground in this downtown area. And I think it's a big mistake to start rebuilding before we look at the problems that are already here. We did a scope on our downtown infrastructure. Todd, did you want to speak to that at all? No, I'm that in here. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, they, they, did, they had a hard look at that in High River, and we had to rebuild. They had already rebuilt a good portion of the downtown businesses and the buildings, and then they had to come back the next year and redid the streetscapes as well as a bunch of the deep infrastructure. Yeah. And that's an ongoing process, and a lot of communities haven't actually done a lot of upgrades over the years on their deep infrastructure. And so it may be an opportunity for this community to use some of this, but you're, you're absolutely correct. I think it would be wise to do that just before we start rebuilding down there. And that, that may be legitimate. It's a kind of a decision that needs to be made by the business owners and by the landlords, right? They've got a, it's, it, there's risk involved for sure. There is 100%, no question that there's some risk involved. And I'm not the guy to answer that. There was risk involved in High River. We had sinkholes you could drive a pickup truck in. But the business owners and the landlords made a decision and they were backed up by the government with mitigation plans and with financing so that they could actually rebuild the community. I don't know what the decisions are going to be made here, neither does Angela, but you're kind of in the same phase now. You're in a phase where people are needing to move forward. If you have to wait for studies to be done and for infrastructure to be checked out, um, I, I can't speak to your business community. It might be quite a bit different than the rest of Canada, but I personally work with about 120 small businesses. And I can tell you right now, if you go 90 days without any cash flow in your business, you got a big problem. I understand that. Yeah. So, so you really do have to move forward, and there needs to be a plan and some help to move forward. Community Futures is one. What Angela and I are talking about is another, um, and you have to you have to do this as a group. You are not going to recover this community if you act independently. You have to actually collaborate on all this. The stakeholders need to be at the table with an equal voice. There shouldn't be any local stakeholder that has a bigger voice at the table for redoing this community than any other voice, because it is a community, and that's what has to happen here. It, 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 if you really want it to be successful, so I hear everything you're saying. I agree with, absolutely with what you're saying. But I'm not going to ask for a show of hands how many can go 90 days without a paycheck. Yeah. But the general rule in Canada is it's not very many. Yeah, I mean, just common sense tells me there should be a process here. We should see, like, the, the infrastructure should have been sure. checked right away. And you should, you should be talking to your town officials about that, and they should be talking to the municipal government, the, the provincial governments about it. No yeah. question. Totally well, agree with you. That's why we formed the Business Renewal Advisory Committee. It was called the BRAC Committee. And it was, so we broke it down when you came in like this, we broke down the active business licenses and I knew what my seven sectors were in the community and I asked them to go sit in tables. And I asked them to tell, talk, tell me their top priorities. I shared this with a, a counselor today and some stakeholders of, of how then your stakeholders, your people, your ones that are servicing you, they want to hear from you. Then they can take that forward and, and, and push it forward and say this is what they need. They're not taking the loans because they're nervous, because they just want to make sure that there's mitigation in place, because they're one of the 10 or something. But that's why that networking discussion and, and serving you guys needs to be there. Yeah, uh, when you were talking about those uh, different uh, plans that uh, have been uh, formulated for the various communities that you've been involved in, so it's a three-stage uh, recovery. Could you describe what, what the three stages are and uh, how long each one takes and what happens in each one? So uh, there's three, uh, I talked to three phases of re uh, recovery, phase one, phase two, phase three. And um, that's what we're talking with Puerto Rico right now and the other communities. Dale is the one that taught this to me, that it, when he came into the community, he gave the recommendations. He talked about, and EDA and, and the other people that were on the team. Jennifer, were you on that team? In High River? Somebody told me you were on. I can't remember nothing that day. Um, so the um, every, this template is just a template, right? So I'm going to share with you what we did in Fort McMurray, what was talked about. But please know that it's going to be different for Grand Forks. But in phase it's one, customized, but yeah, good. yeah, what, what yeah. Is the kind of the in phase one, we have a uh, you immediately need to have a uh, pop. The businesses that are evacuated, when they're evacuated out of town, they want to call somebody to say, I've just left, what are my resources, what are the first things I do? And so we deployed a, a um, 
for 4,000 businesses that were evacuated. Oh God, I, we were receiving like 1,800 calls a day. We were open for 12 hours a day. And I think that we had that hotline going. And those business owners just needed somebody to talk to. And every time new resources came available or communication from council or anything that happened, that was the conduit. And then we, they had a website up, a one-stop shop website for business recovery. So that's part of that recovery hotline. Monetary relief for the businesses. So we worked with Red Cross. These people need money right now. They're not, well, we didn't know when they were going back and forth, but we didn't even know the fire out, right? So that's why they were immediately given a thousand dollars. We had they get them registered on the hotline, and once they were registered on the hotline, they do you want an active business license? They had to go through a declaration of who they were, and then we were able to give them money right away. The business recovery welcome center. So when they came into town, they had a one-stop shop and a human face to talk to. So this is something that I, for $72,000, we, Bull Valley College was like your Selkirk College, and that was the one place that you could go for marketing. Um, we had a, an assistant in there for anybody, networking, meeting space, anything like that. We had that ready, and that was going for six months. It's just the first, the, the first 30 days, 60 days are crucial of that phase one. And then the business recovery trade shows start to happen at the end of, at the end of that phase. They're up and they're going. They're recovering, bringing in uh, the, uh, the um, access to money. So they, so the loans is very important in that time. So if you've got to pay your suppliers or your staff, bringing in Revenue Canada so that you can get the employment going, insurance going for them. Um, other resources were. The, the expo that we did and then we started to get the insurance bureau that these guys have coming because though that insurance bureau of canada that's coming they're neutral like they're here to work for you so they'll help you understand your claim so those are some ideas that happen in phase one and then you want to start to move into phase two and that's why when dale's saying he's coming from september is he's going to start to look at the bigger picture of the recovery assessment. What is the impact of the damage that's been done on the community? But they just did that impact study for BC wildfires. Um, it was an RFP that was put out, and that's telling them where the weak is, where the strengths are. You do a SWOT analysis on, so you can do a prop, prop. We got the businesses going, they're up, but now we need to do an economic recovery plan. We, in phase two, is when, at the end of phase one, is when we started to do that temporary business part. We ran that for in that transition time, of eight months to get your business up and going. So we transitioned from the temporary business park to the next one. So we're moving towards it. Phase three is what we're just in the marketing campaign. So if you Googled High River a year ago, you would see some awful images. Because the ones that are the most hit and followed, those are the ones that go to the top. YouTube, anything, that's the way it works. Uh, with the um, Internet of Things. So when we realize, no one's like our real estate, our uh, community attraction stuff, if we don't start telling a good story. So we hired a marketing firm and that they focused on getting, and that's why those hashtags are so important. We had YYC, um, uh, Calgary is open for business. When this report came from the technical team from High River, and I took this to council, one of them was in there, get marketing, get going for phase two. We were able to use that, and we called up the government and said, you're giving all the money to Calgary, but what about all of us that we've been affected? No one's talking. So then it was changed to YYC and area is open, and region is open. So that's why I purposely, did you guys see the poster of the business owners um, on the front of the event for tonight? That was one of the advertising campaigns. So you guys could do this tomorrow. You could all meet here at 2 o'clock and invite Les down to come um, speak at, and take a picture of you guys and all so hold signs open and then have your hashtags, build back better. And start to tell the good story. Start to, so that then when people Google Grand Forks, they're like, wow, look at that beautiful town. Look at them, they're just, wow, wow, wow. They're just building, they're going and everything. New business is coming on. Tim Horton's coming on. Tell everybody. We have a major, if he didn't love Tim Hort, if he didn't love Grand Forks, they wouldn't be invested. So we want to start to tell that story. That'll happen in phase two and it continues in phase three. Phase three now, we're also going to be continuing the marketing, transitioning out of it, and then our business retention programs. So we're going to be putting in some long-term programs of how to sustain the business community, giving them resources and tools and connections. Um, that'll be the last phase. And um, what's the other one? 
the broad, oh, the uh, long-term economic development strategy. So they're probably seeing us, but we're going to be setting the town up now with the last bit of the recovery money to build a plan for the next 10 years and with some job descriptions and stuff in there. So when recovery is all over and all the resources are over and we're on year five, so we have two more years to do this, they're set. They're set up. So we've leveraged the opportunity and all the money that came into the community. Does that make sense? I know it's pretty heavy, but... Oh, wow, Santa. We're open. Come on over. <laughs> Is there any other questions? He's, he's holding an open site. A really good opportunity for some of that photoing is I, I will be down, I don't know if you know, Boardroom Cafe's one year anniversary is tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And they are open at oh, 11? 10. 10? Yeah. Uh, I've got a couple meetings, but I'm planning on going there at noon with a group of people and trying to get some photos. So if anybody's out and about and around, please come down, grab a coffee, and let's do a photo and start that. So I'll be there at noon if people can please come out. And uh, there are new businesses that are opening all the time, so I'm just trying to stay and bring out these minutes. But in contact as well with Susan Green, who's getting those, and the Gazette also is offering every week to update where people are, where you're relocating, uh, once you're reopened again, they're, they're putting that out there. So be in contact with Diana, and make sure you get that out there, because I will use those resources to make sure that as you guys reopen and are there, that we really make a huge event, because I have nothing but yards and yards and yards of ribbon. Let's use it. <laughs> so again, it's important also for that information to get to Dasha at the visitor center because she's because that's where we see all the tourists are coming in and they're asking questions, and so she needs to know also what's open and how she can direct. Perfect. I did email her on those resources for checking with Susan Green and with Diane, but I will make sure that I check with Diane. RebuildGF.com is available. RedoGF.com is available. I just checked for phase three. Showoffgrandforks.com I own. It exists. Showoffgf.com. Showoffgrandforks.com. Another initiative that we did was a community vitality fund. We had members of large, so just out, with like just some residents, sit on a committee, and uh, I think we had one council representative from it. And um, so recovery money, the, the council or the recovery department, I don't know who made the decision, took the recovery money and said there has to be certain pillars put on it, but it was the way to get the money back to the business community, or back to the community. So um, you could apply for the community vitality fund money, and you would go and you present to the committee, and you'd say under this pillar of non-for-profit, I heard you have a women's resource office center that's gone. Yeah, your non-for-profits are business owners. They're just as important, if not more important, not, not to be ill, but if you don't have um, a strong vitality community, which means your non-for-profits, your schools, your health, all that kind of stuff. So this allowed us to get money to you so that you could build some stuff that you're needing in there. So setting up the uh, community vitality fund, and I can share that with anybody that they would like, the term of references, how we did it, the model, the money. I'm waiting for your recovery departments to get up and going. Um, I know they've hired somebody in the pillars are already started. I'm going to be available. I'll be sharing this stuff to them, but it's a way to get some money out to you guys on there. And you guys, if you've got some non-for-profits that are hurting in this community, and I'm, can I just use as an example oh, absolutely. right now? So what is it, the women's? So we have the Boundary Resource Center through the Boundary Women's Coalition, and we're just 268 Market. Um, so yeah, we're just drying out and being uh, uh, restored at the moment. So really, they're just, and it really depends on what stage everybody's at throughout that entire side on that side. So um, one of our neighbors also, um, there's an asbestos warning on their door, so I'm assuming that everybody's looking, you know, all the recovery folks know about all those pieces. So we're just kind of waiting to see how long it's going to take. Do you need space right now? We actually, we've got to put a shout out to the Métis Association. We're sharing space with the Métis Association right now. They invited us in um, at the Slovenic Hall. Um, so we're, we're up and, and uh, running as of next week. So if this is a non-for-profit, uh, if we all pull our social enterprise heartstrings, 
let's put on a benefit down here for them. Let's get creative of something that we can do for a purpose so we both win. We're going to raise money for this non for profit, but we're also going to bring traffic flow to shop on our doors. <laughs> this is crazy, but I've seen a massive bake sale because anybody just wants some reason to come. It's like those lemonade stands on, the, on that, but the more important, it's not the $20 pie you bought. Yes, I bought a $20 pie. I think my husband's bought 100 alcohol was served. <laughs> but um, it's the purpose. It's it's like writing a donation check, right? It's where it's going, and that so you can start to pull these heartstrings with these events on there. So thank you for coming because I learned a lesson. It took me about two years to realize non-for-profits are just like you, for some reason you see it right on the storefronts and not enough. So uh, anything else? The last thing I want to end with is mental health um, for all of you in your community. Um, just look out for each other. Uh, five years in this, I know how important it is, but I'm going to just talk a little bit about my story, about how I cracked on it, so I can't even imagine how you are. If you can start to share the resources as much as you can, if you can be there for a business owner, it's going to be going like this. If Just try to get those resources together, try to see those signs, and be there for each other, because this is not a sprint. It's a marathon to recover. To do it right, it's going to take a long time, so please take care of yourselves. Self-care through it all. Okay? We've got a piece of hope for everybody here. I'm a, I'm a realtor, and I can tell you people are still wanting to move. And it's almost as busy as it was last year. Okay, so just, uh, so that's good hope for you guys downtown here. We're, we'll drag them in by hook or by crook. We'll get them. Awesome. Okay. Good news. Is there any other success? Is there someone that's had some awesome sales or some? Let's end on a high. Like, what's some good things? So, we were fortunate. Park Soul Coast was not hit by anything. We are out of the floodplain. Yay. But you know what? People are coming. People were first coming just to give us a hug and say, we're so glad you're okay. People are bringing me quilts. Yeah, I was in Medicine Hat working this past weekend at a quilt show. Ladies, I had never met before in my life in the quilts to bring back to our community. I have a stack like this of people that are, that care about us. They want to see us comforted and, and left feeling good and knowing that there's hope and people are thinking about us. My business, I was shocked. I could count when I reopened because I was busy doing everything everybody else is doing. But we did reopen. And I was excited, I had business one day, and then a two the next day, and a few. And this past weekend, I was working in Medicine Hat. I had staff in, and they were busy. And I am really thrilled. People are coming. And they are coming maybe anywhere. They're coming from out of town, they are just coming. So I think we do have that opportunity, and it's important to make the best of it. So it's happening. People do care. Let's care about ourselves. Um, I, I've had customers email or call me from Vancouver, from Calgary, from Red Deer, from all over BC, asking how I am and when I'm going to reopen. And I think it's important when people reach out to you like that, that you keep in touch with them and let them know what's happening. I was really touched. I, I didn't expect that at all. Yeah. There's great, great things that come out of a disaster. It's really, really neat. Our first event, July 20th, yep. is a Friday night. We have recording artist Lisa Nicole. She's in Nashville right now recording her next CD. She's coming to do a benefit for our community. Oh. That'll be on the 20th of July. We uh, have some creative ideas. Uh, there was talk about getting butterflies and releasing hundred butterflies. Oh, nice. And, and, and There's the a healing component to butterfly, too. Um, yeah. We're looking at other yeah. creative things for that piece. Yeah. yeah. Um, our theater. Hmm? Where is it right here? Right downtown. Oh, yeah. thank you. Are the owners of the theater here? No, no they're not. Okay, so I had a good conversation with them. They, they're 
I love them and yeah. positive. And we did a little video because of that energy. Um, I'm going to give it to stakeholders to decide if you want to use it. But uh, it was like, they were like, oh, we're, they're so sweet, dude. So uh, in High River, we had the culture minister, minister of culture and arts or whatever their title was. They came down and there was grant money available because it was a heritage um, building. And um, so I'm going to send that information to them to see if they can leverage it with their BC government too. But Because um, to have an old theater like that, to be using for lots of events down the road or grads and stuff, let, if we gotta do some fun, we I'm gonna leave here. <laughs> you gonna do some fundraising for them or something too? Yeah, I, would I don't wanna see that lost down here. You wanna keep as many of event things to do in your downtown too. Okay. Well, thank you. I just think we'll do one more thing that I forgot to do. And I don't know if she's curious about looking around. I know Les is right here right now. There you oh, Hi. Right up front in front of me. Uh, for anyone who didn't know, because I didn't know, Lorraine is actually up and functioning. So if you guys email to her and you need things printed or faxed or those types of things, you have to all fax. Just print. No, no fax. Just print. So if you want to send things off. So I didn't know that. And that was definitely a service that I needed last week. And I was really pumped when I found that out. So... You have about five emails. Do you have access to your inventory? Packet. Not all of it, no. But you can, you can, because I've had a lot of questions. From people coming to me asking where you are and can can they do access to the stationary reams of paper yes. and all kinds of stuff. Well, Till tapes. So, yeah. Till tapes. Yeah. Yeah. Debit tapes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ink card with these colors. Yeah. No, yeah. Um, How do we do it? Like, Same with that. Okay. Oh, okay. Good. Thank you. <laughs> so, and following up for that with Lorraine too, because we ordered our order our filing cabinets through, so um, that would take a lot of sense to even as we get to that stage, because we won't be open for a while. To can we pre-order some of the things that we will need that you that, um, or how does that work? I can only get them drop shipped right now. Okay. So, but I do have. No, I don't have one of your filing cabinets. So that's the food bank. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because we're all going to be ordering yeah. so many things as opposed mm -hmm. to us ordering from staples or some, you know, to be able to have that flow yeah. through through the community still. The only problem we have is that our garage is full up <coughs> and we have forward space in somebody else's garage they gra graciously let us use, but yeah. we can't really use that as a warehouse. Right. But if your only is issue is storage, because that's becoming an issue all over for both homeowners and businesses, I've been working with Brett Swope, so we have some seed cans coming in, and, and one of the seed cans is full of office furniture and uh, household furniture based on the emails that I received from Sonoma oh, on what they still needed. So if you have things and you're like, I didn't know about this, it's not too late, send me an email. If there's something you can use, it's a local, non, non, it's a non-profit in um, Vancouver that I met when I went to that chamber at GM um, called Urban Repurpose. And they, generally speaking, sell those things for their non-profit society. But when they saw what happened, wanted to reach out and support. So the president of their board reached out to me and has offered anything that they have in their warehouse if it can go to somebody we need it. Um, I know the chamber has quite a list because we lost everything, literally everything. <laughs> so we're, we've got quite a list in there of different things that we're looking for. Um, and they've got things from countertops and boardroom tables, office chairs, office equipment, that kind of thing, more the furniture stuff, as well as they have some appliances and building supplies for homeowners. So if you want to get that request in, send me the list. The first sh shipment is supposed to be scheduled coming out in about three weeks. We know that we're going to need more than one shipment because the list was pretty extensive and I knew it was going to be. I didn't walk into this lightly. So Brett Swope, if you don't know him, he's one of the local volunteers who's been really advocating and helping both of uh, He worked first with Red Cross and Salvation Army and now he's working with uh, Samaritan's Purse. So he's offered up his property for us to put those ski cans. So if there's things that you're ordering in and you're going through the rain and you guys need storage, please reach out because um, maybe I can hook you up with some of those storage pieces because that, that's our goal is to try and go through you as much as possible for those things. I know that we lost all of our, like the office supplies that became less priority as I tried to throw water were things like the rings of paper on the ground, my business cards. Um, those types of pens, paper, like I just, I focused on our files and things that I can't replace. My desk. <laughs> Your desk was the last pair. That thing's heavy. <laughs> um, this, this probably applies more to re retail people, but, um, you know, if you're open and running now and, and you know of a 
a retailer that, that is closed and waiting for their building to be uh, brought up to speed. Um, consider doing pop-up things like Savannah from the Boardroom Cafe generously offered her bathroom for me to have a pop-up store there at the end of the month. So think about things like that where we can collaborate and help along businesses that can't get back into their buildings right away. Or if you have space to share. Yeah. You, know, you can move some inventory out of the way and let somebody else put the you know, key items in there to help yeah. out. Just so that they have a presence on the street when people come down to our selection. Now, I mean, just something that people need to know. Don't close your door because you're being redone. Leave your door open and let people come in and look at the mess and look at how much it's progressing because people are hurting terribly. And if they can see that there is hope, and sure, you might not have anything in there, but they can see that there is hope and that you're not going to close the doors because that's the other thing we keep getting asked because John and a few of us are always open. We don't have a business, but we're always open. <laughs> but if they need people to do that, they need to be able to have a cup of coffee with you or sit down or look in your business. It doesn't matter what business it is. Look in and they'll say, oh, that's terrible, but you're fixing it. Well, it helps and if people don't have covers on the windows. As I walk downtown, every day and I, and I look through the windows and when I see work in progress it gives me encouragement and hope that things are happening okay they're renovation oh, crews I in. totally forgot uh, uh, we have the arts we have the art society in town yes we got them supplies window paint and they totally decorated all the windows they run around and painted them so that it didn't look yucky yeah. they made it like you could do and they would tell inspiring stories on the windows I totally forgot about that so thank you yeah Clean them up, make it fun, right, instead of just paper on it. So even if you take the paper down, but you put some black or white on there, we tell an inspiration story. The people can see through it. Yeah. We'll see progress or progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So. You all have phones with cameras. You know, if you could just take a picture from the same spot of your inside of your store, day 15, day 20, day yeah. 30, but sooner or later there'll be a retrospective coffee book or whatever, and, yes. you know, just be nice to see the progress, right? Yeah. Is there something else? Oh, no, it's just that people need to know yeah. that we're all alive and well. Yeah. And and I don't mean downtown business people. I mean people within our community. Exactly. Once they've lost their houses and think there's no hope, and they come down and they go, oh, they're, they're doing something, and they're doing something, and you're having a laugh right now. <laughs> Jobus has had 11 layers of flooring taken out. I've had six, and I've still got three remaining. <laughs> you know, you're like, smiling. And you're happy. <laughs> That's the history of our spirit. Well, Roger's now is now about as tall as he got more yes. headroom. <laughs> but, but that's and that's what they want to hear, and that's what they want to see. Yeah, and and so it's fun back in. And I do have my windows painted, by the way. Uh, but that was done before the flood. <laughs> well, I want uh, Chris. Yeah, I just wanted to remind people, um, everybody should have either physically gotten a hard copy of this or been emailed one. And this is a survey that the Downtown Business Association is doing, collecting information regarding your insurance claims, whether you've been denied, if you have insurance, whether you've been denied, why you've been denied, uh, what your deductible is, what your immediate um, short-term losses have been, which would mean, what have you put out of pocket so far? Have you had to buy a pop? Have you had to buy hoses? Have you had to pay staff? What have you lost in income over the past five weeks or three weeks? And what do you anticipate your long-term loss is going to be? We know we have a lot of people that have had mixed messages from insurance companies or been outright denied for reasons that, that are different from their neighbors. And so we want to gather all this information. We put a spreadsheet together, a database, and we're going to be sharing this with Community Futures and with our MLA and the Larson, and we're going to be talking to the Insurance Bureau of Canada and wanting to find out why there's so many discrepancies with some of the insurance policies. And we're going to take it to the province and let them know where our shortfalls are financially so that we can help you as much as possible. So if you haven't already filled this out, please fill it out. You can email it back to Lynn. How do you get it from your website? This, I email these were emailed to all the businesses within the downtown. So if you have a business downtown or a landlord downtown and you have your email address, you should have received it in your email. I can give you, I haven't got a whole lot, but I can give you a whole copy. Okay. 
Peter, I gave one to Peter Somersville on behalf of your business. I gave one to Somersville on behalf of them. You're welcome to take one, though, because I haven't received it back from him. I have a couple more if anybody doesn't have one and they need one. Thanks, Chris. And, and, and just piggybacking on, on Chris's comment, we, we will have the Insurance Bureau of Canada here available for the businesses who want to sit down and talk with them on June 25th. If you, if you want to talk with them, please call Community Futures and ask for Jennifer, and I will make you an appointment with them. To talk with you? Insurance Bureau of Canada. Okay, so if, if you are a business owner or a building owner who has been impacted, who is struggling, um, you know, through the claims process and want some clarification, want to be able to talk to an, an advocacy body that can help kind of maybe try to sort things out at a higher level, please call us to make an appointment, okay, June 25th. That will also be the same day that we will kickstart off some of the work that we're doing with the British Columbia Economic Development Association around recovery team. First foray into the community, um, and I'm sorry for asking you some of the same questions that you've been asked, uh, but we appreciate getting data from both the DBA and the Chamber that will help feed up through there. Please be patient with us if we ask you the same questions. And, and um, yeah, if you have any questions or are there any, you know, kind of bits and pieces that you feel haven't been addressed here tonight, please just give us a call and, and we can usually help direct you in a certain way. But um, those are just two pieces burning right now in the next few weeks. Thanks, Jennifer. So any other questions or suggestions or needs or? Well, I want to thank both Angela and Todd for coming tonight.